Welcome everyone to this uh, Cyber Future and Parachains virtual event. We are super happy to have you all there. Today we are going to talk about Kusama, Metadata, Polkadot, Art, NFTs, Mixed Reality, and all that related topics and all kinds of fun. Uh, one presentation the speakers are ready and we are going to kick off today's show is following so the first speaker will be bruno from uh, the author of our america standard which is the nft standard on kusam um then vicky and Gemma uh, are going to have together a session which will be focused more on the development um, Chiba Gallery and all kinds of uh, development related uh, NFT stuff. Then uh, Val will be presenting Kodadot, which I'm not really sure what his presentation is about it, but he will be talking about NFTs, gallery, and all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, lastly, Jessica Angel will uh, be presenting her Voxel Bridge project, which is the a uh, mixed reality uh, project that is running on Kusama and she will tell you more about how the project is running basically on Kusama and how you can run the art project on Kusama. So that's my intro. Thank you so much uh, for coming over and we can kick off with Bruno. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Annette. Um, hello, hello. We are going to briefly run through what Remark is, what it's about, and where it's going. And uh, if there's time, you can ask questions. If, if not, then you can just hit me up on Telegram or Twitter or whatever else you want. Um, let me just quickly share my screen. This should be fine. Uh, let me know, please, if this disappears in any way um, or if something happens. Um, if you cannot see my screen, the, the presentation in full screen, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just continue. So this is about the Remark protocol and what we are building, um, what actually turned out to be art Legos. So like DeFi has money Legos, this turned out to be art Legos when we put together all the innovations that, that we've done. So I want to briefly introduce what, what's, what's going on here. Um, if you don't know about me, I'm the technical educator at the Web3 Foundation, and I, uh, I I came up with the Remark standard last year to make sure that Kusama doesn't miss out on the NFT craze. And um, earlier this year, we uh, formed a full-time team around Remark to actually drive the, the development forward uh, with like a dedicated team that can actually, you know, um, devote themselves fully to this uh, without any any kind of oversight or, or whatever other complications. Um, so what is what is Remark? Remark is a system for graffitiing the blockchain and extracting value from those graffiti. So what does that actually mean? It means that when you, um, it means that, so if we take, for example, this blue turtle, if you go, if you walk through town and you see a blue turtle spray painted on, on, a, on a wall, you would think that it's not nice of vandals to do that, or you would think that it's a nice image, and that's it. But if a gang member of the gang Red Turtles sees this, then they will know that they have to turn around or they'll get their ass kicked. And so this, they know this because these gangs, they share a common language that they understand. They can extract additional meaning from graffiti. So something that we see as just an image, they see as a message. And so this is how Remark works. When you when you send a Remark transaction on Kusama, you send some custom information alongside that transaction. And the tools and the standard, the, the Remark standard, is a set of rules that tells different tools how to interpret these messages. So it's kind of like an instru instruction manual for how to read these, these messages and get, get value out of them. And so in essence, Remark kind of gives you value where there is none. So it kind of, it hacks NFTs onto Kusama. Um, 
it basically uh, pretends that the messages are NFTs and thereby they become NFTs. Just like we pretend that uh, any cryptocurrency has value or we pretend that we believe uh, the system is maintaining a true state of everything. So uh, this is how the remark system pretends that there's a value there, even though it's just messages that it's interpreting in a special special format. Um, and so that's, that's basically what it can do. It can uh, interpret these remarks and these remarks are just random messages, random words that you shout into the chain, that you graffiti your transactions with. Um, this happens because every substrate chain, which includes Polkadot and Kusama and any other substrate chain, uh, has support for this remark functionality. Uh, somebody's unmuted. Could you mute, please? So that's a big one. Work for it. Um, okay. And so uh, we have we have here the, the situation where we can actually interpret any kind of message because the, the substrate chains that this is this can be deployed on all have the same system module. And this system module has this remark function. And this remark function is this one function that we call that actually sends out this message into the blockchain. Now, this message doesn't actually get stored on the chain. It gets stored beside the chain in its database. But every node that is processing the chain is aware of this message. So this doesn't uh, change the blockchain's data, but it does change what the blockchain knows about itself in the, da in the database on the hard drive. It's a bit hard to explain, but you can imagine it as just um, you shout a message at somebody and they're not affected by this in any way other than just remembering that you shouted at them. So this is how remarks work. You, sh you shout at the blockchain and the blockchain remembers it, but doesn't do anything about it. And so to do something about it, you need the remark tools. So the RMRK tools, the remark tools to process those messages. Um, what this allows us to do is we get to have really fast iteration. So we're not constrained by existing standards or uh, some really slow to evolve marketplaces. Like if you if you come up with a truly unique um, standard for NFTs, a truly unique set of functionalities, you would have a very hard time pitching that to different marketplaces on Ethereum and auction houses and whatnot, uh, because they're used to ERC eleven fifty five, ERC seven twenty one, and they're not exactly interested in listing something that's not under those standards uh, unless you wrap it into those standards, and so and then you lose the additional functionality that you added on top. Um, which is good for the for the like standardization of the entire ecosystem. But since the Kusama ecosystem is so new, and since we have this um, you know like hands untied freedom in Remark to actually uh, develop our own stuff our own way without being hindered by these these ossified standards and rules, and um, maybe some bureaucratic overhead that you might encounter when, when trying to push out a standard in Ethereum, this allows us to really really iterate quickly. And so this quick iteration has led to some capabilities that I think are, are, are quite the big deal in the NFT universe and that um, several NFT projects, marketplaces, uh, chains and other teams have already gotten excited enough about to be ready to adopt them. And so we've, we've already established some partnerships there uh, like uh, Unift, like Unique, and some other uh, projects that we'll announce very soon. And so what, what these NFTs that we've built on top of this can do, or will be able to do uh, by the time, by June 1st, um, is, is the following. So we have reactive and conditional NFTs, where NFTs can react to emoticons that are sent to them, but also to any other on-chain or off-chain information. So if you have something like an image of a moon and then you send 50 rocket emojis to it, a rocket can land on that moon. So that's a reactive image. And if you have conditional rendering, if you have like, imagine if the Mona Lisa were an NFT and imagine if you as the owner of that NFT had the power to flick a switch and make the Mona Lisa blush or scream out Coca-Cola uh, whenever everybody's looking at it, right? That's, that's a pretty big power trip. And that's something that... Um, you can't really do with traditional art. So you get this conditional rendering where the, the, the what you see depends on some certain, some conditions are on and around the NFT. And also you have this reactive ability of the NFT where it can react to some changing state on the chain. So like even if something as banal as 
if the block number right now is even, then show something, and if, it, if it's odd, then show something else. Um, we then have multi-resource NFTs, which support multiple assets per single NFT. So if I publish a video game as an NFT, I can have it contain the source code that gets run when you load it, the cover image uh, for the game, the, the instruction manual, and everything else that I want in a single NFT. And depending on how you load it, that resource will load. So if I load it in a browser, like in, in, the, in a game environment, then the game is going to load. If I load it in a PDF reader, then the instruction manual is going to load. And if I load it into OpenSea to sell it, then it's going to show the high resolution image of the, of the, of the game, of the game cover. Um, we have NFT DAOs where every NFT that's published on this system can be fractionalized into fungible tokens. And this means that you have fractional ownership of an NFT for the purpose of composing this with Art Legos, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, in a bit. And then we have nested NFTs, where NFTs can own other NFTs, which means that uh, you can imagine it as an in-game character having an inventory. And they have other things in their inventory, which can also be other NFTs. So as an, as an in-game character, I might have an NFT that's a health potion, and then I can drink it, right? That, that's the consume operation uh, of the NFT. So you essentially burn an NFT to use it uh, for some purpose, in this case, to drink a health potion. And now when you put all of these together, we have a very interesting case of these art Legos where you can imagine um, a multiverse, um, a metaverse where you actually go into a virtual environment and you have a big billboard that is actually an NFT. That billboard can have many owners because it would be fractionalized into fungible tokens. So a lot of people could own tokens of that billboard to control that billboard. And so what you could do then is maybe Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Nike could mint a new NFT that's basically a texture for that billboard. And now they can send that NFT to the billboard because the billboard is an NFT that can own NFTs. They send it to the billboard's inventory. And now what the, what, the, what the NFT DAO owners can do, they can vote collectively with their tokens on which texture this NFT is going to load. So which texture is going to get shown on the billboard in the virtual ecosystem. And now the corporations have to compete to bribe, basically, the DAO token holders to decide on their texture to be rendered in the um, in the metaverse, and now you have like community-based management of virtual resources and virtual real estate, which I think is very powerful when you expand it to the expand it to the entire uh, virtual space, and also when you mix in some mixed reality and you divide the plots of real-world land into uh, geographic plots that you can note, then you can. Um, you can list as NFTs uh, with their coordinates. Then if you own that NFT, you can also deploy stuff on that plot of land. And so now we're just one step away from having our own customizable virtual world where we're just all waiting for that one little lens that will pop into our eye and see the augmented reality around us. And then we'll be able to see what people build on the virtual but augmented real uh, plots of land that they purchased in the NFT world. And I think that's really, really exciting, especially with these art Legos that you can now combine with these conditional renderings and multi-resources. And uh, when it all comes together, it's a very dynamic set of NFTs that can evolve with the platform that it's built on. Um, that said, Remark, because it works like it works, it's no smart contracts, it's just graffiti. It has two significant downsides. One is slowness, so it's very difficult to synchronize this uh, latest state of remarks, you have to basically use an archive node, which has all the information from the beginning of, remark, of the remark project. And then you squash that information, consolidate it into one final truth, uh, truthy state. Um, this is not that difficult right now, but it's not going to get easier with time. It's only going to get harder as Kusama grows, because that time to sync will only extend and extend. And we have some tools that work around this, but ideally, there would be a common canonical state on chain that all tools can refer to, which is achieved with either runtimes or uh, smart contracts. And so that's why Remark will be co-deploying the standards that we've built for the composable NFTs and everything on the unique network first, so that we have this runtime upgrade needed for fast fetching. But it will also uh, exist in parallel natively on Kusama and also any other chain in the Kusama sisterhood, um, so that we have this, this multiverse uh, expansion already uh, as soon as possible. But we're doing this migration to Unique 
and enabling people to move their uh, Remark NFTs to Unique for ease of use and basically safety against double buying. So double buying is the, the second downside. And that's um, if somebody lists an NFT for sale, if two people buy it in the same block, then there's no way because there are no smart contracts, there's no way to refund that second invalid purchase. And so the seller is paid twice. And so we've built a comprehensive set of tools to protect against this, which is currently deployed on our proof of concept marketplace, uh, testing this exact bug. So we're trying to we're trying to see how how common it is, whether or not it happens, how safe it is, and um, we're just testing the code that we built to protect against these two downsides before we can move to logic like runtimes or smart contracts. Uh, so far, it's worked out great, but uh, we'd rather not have these downsides at, at all, right? So these are these are two things to keep in mind when you when you do this type of hack. Um, and so our proof of concept is called Canaria, and Canaria is at the same time three things. It's a fundraise to finance Remark Teams independence, so that we don't have to uh, you know like keep scrounging for money and asking for grants repeatedly. Uh, it's a tech test that's a proof of against these vulnerabilities or downsides. So um, it's just like a like an in production test of what our what the technology we've built can do to protect you against these downsides. And it's also a demo of our NFT ICO launchpad. So if this works out fine, then we'll just package this up for public domain use and everybody will be able to launch their own NFT collection very easily, uh, just like Canaria. And Canaria is basically a set of uh, limited edition digital eggs that will hatch into certain birds after a while and produce um, long lasting platform benefits. So. People are sending emotes to these eggs and they are pumping them full of these uh, icons and emotions. And then the bird that hatches from the egg will have a specific look and feel based on the emotes that it got. Um, some people are already selling their uh, heavily emoted eggs and a marketplace is, is forming slowly but surely. Uh, when, the, when the birds hatch, they will, they will have a certain set of traits. Um, they will have a certain set of equipment. And this is where we'll leverage the conditional rendering and the reactive stuff because the birds will actually own and equip some of the items that they will randomly get because of the emojis and because of the blockchain's randomness. And so your bird might have a tennis racket in its in its hand, might have a helmet or something, and you will be able to unequip this helmet and sell it to somebody else. So you will be getting NFTs with NFTs and you will be able to sell them around. So we've built the, the basically the first truly global, uh, basically game uh, where we have these, these characters that you can modify, but also that bring long lasting platform bonuses in the form of uh, discounts and whitelists and much more on all Remark UIs and apps and all partner Remark uh, apps and UIs and projects that we're working on. So the timeline for this entire thing is we had a private claim where people could claim eggs uh, without the public interface. We had we have the public claim which is going on now. Uh, there, then there's going to be an emote snap where we'll just cut off the emote date and freeze the emotes so that people can no longer, they can still submit emotes, but they'll no longer have an effect. Uh, this is to give time to our artists during the Tory phase to draw these custom birds. Uh, and then in the final stage, you will, we will have the ho-ho phase, which is the burn of the un, unclaimed eggs. So they're all going to be burned to reduce the supply. And then there's going to be the fair drop. Now, the fair drop is an airdrop of the Remark token. And this is going to be airdropped in full to all the egg doctors. So everybody who got an egg, everybody who had an egg is going to get an airdrop proportional to the claimed eggs of this token. Um, the token is also going to finance grants and it's going to finance a mint drop where everybody is going to be encouraged, incentivized to mint on Remark platforms and Remark partner platforms. Um, they're going to get an airdrop of this token based on their usage throughout a year. And uh, finally, there's going to be a private and public sale of the leftover. If 100% of the eggs get claimed, then there's not going to be any kind of sale. Um, this, is, this was all made because um, it turns out that a lot of people can't participate in, in funding a project like this unless they have the ability to get tokens. So they can't do eggs, but they can do tokens. And so now we're hoping that all eggs are sold out and all the tokens are just airdropped. But if they're not, then we're going to offer the remainder to these people who can only participate this way. That's, that's why this was, this was done this way, basically. Um, and so to wrap up, uh, the lessons that we've learned here are, are kind of 
there, there have been a couple of lessons that I think are important. Um, number one is if you're doing any kind of uh, any kind of fundraiser on a new platform, uh, you will find that you have enough barriers to begin with with people just getting onto that platform. So installing the wallet and getting the tokens that they need and so on. And that KYC is just gonna make that worse. So KYC absolutely sucks, but it's absolutely necessary for keeping your users safe and your team safe. Uh, you could do without KYC, but it's very, very expensive uh, both ways. So if you do without KYC, um, then you will almost guaranteed end up in trouble in a few years but you're gonna have a really good time very early on. Um, and if you do KYC, then it's gonna be very, very expensive and lost funding because it's gonna introduce a hell of a lot of barriers uh, for people and people are just gonna walk away and that's not, not something that, that you want to happen to you. Um, so it's kind of a Sophie's choice here. Uh, you can decide to go either way. I would still recommend going the KYC route just to be safe, to keep your users safe and to keep your team safe, but be aware that this is going to be a very, an absolutely terrible experience. Um, absolutely honored I artist, uh, pay well for good art, um, keep your artists around. They are the bread and butter of your platform and your protocol and, um, seek them out actively, uh, partner up with them, promote them as if, as, as if their work was your own and, uh, help them rise in your platform, help them, help them do better, uh, because like they all deserve it. And all of, most of them are taken for granted by the current industry uh outside of blockchain so um while there's there is indeed a surplus of different creators um you should absolutely honor each and every one of them as if they were unique because they are and finally men sana in project sana keep relationships healthy uh, follow through with partnerships so don't make partnerships and promises um you cannot keep <coughs> otherwise People will lose faith in your project and will just go away, go elsewhere. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have really productive and good partners that have, uh, you know, kickstarted some projects with us and that, that are moving along swimmingly, uh, even though it's a small team and stuff. But we too have overcommitted in, in a lot of things. Um, we're still doing the best we can here, but when you're trying to keep everybody safe and then at the same time do everything else that we have to do to make this project a reality, it's very easy to overpromise and underdeliver. So be, be very uh, wary of that. And um, that's pretty much it. If you want to learn more about any of these projects, either Canary or Remark, hit me up, let me know, and I'd be happy to explain anything um, in Telegram or via email. So uh, just shoot. Cheers. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much, Bram. Uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to drop to the chat, uh, but I don't see any questions right now uh, for you, Bruno. So, uh, I will go next. So, I would like to welcome Val on stage. Feel free to unmute yourself. I think he went, he took a short pause for like two minutes. Yes. As I see the telegram. Wow. Okay. So we have a very short pause. Um, okay. Um, well, are you ready already or you are not there? Okay, so I'm so sorry for that we have a new question there in the meantime. Um uh Bruno, there is a question for you. Um can you go to the question? Um Yeah, sure. So 
that says graffiti for each transaction and then reading them back to validate every consequent transaction, is it not a huge overhead as the transactions increase over the years? It absolutely is. And that is why that is exactly why we are moving uh, away from this remark-based system as soon as possible. Now, there are several approaches that are being explored. One is putting smart contracts on Kusama. Uh, this is unlikely, but possible. And if that happens, everybody would be uh, extremely happy. The other is putting NFT primitives on Kusama, which would enable us to have really, really primitive NFTs on Kusama with no custom logic and functionality, but it would enable us to have uh, up-to-date up state without having to read the history, which also helps a lot. And then other parts of the strategy are just using the connected chains when they come. So when parachain functionality is activated, instead move everything uh, regarding logic and history into unique or moonbeam or any such uh, such chain with smart contracts or runtime logic that can accommodate this. So we definitely do not want to stay long term on an inefficient model, and we will be looking forward to moving away from it as soon as possible. This is why we're developing Remark 2.0 to be chain agnostic and to basically have a well-defined interface but to be deployable in any kind of environment that um, would basically be able to host it. That was super helpful. Thank you so much for answering that question. Uh, in the meantime, Bo, are you ready for your talk? Oh, uh, I think it was a microphone problem. Okay, so yeah, welcome. And uh, let me sort the stuff. Oh. I should like export a PDF, okay? Wait a sec. Uh, you can share your screen as well, so we probably don't need to export uh, anything. Will it work? Yes, nice you call. can see your slides. Okay. Okay, so wow, so nice to meet you, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak here. And yeah, actually, yeah, I expecting they are going to last. So yeah, uh, yeah, I would like to talk and uh, what were our efforts as the Dakota team and what we plan uh, next. And uh, yeah, I will try to give some nice reflections what we done and what we like had to do go through and something like that. So yeah, uh, how I can scroll with this stuff? Okay, so can you see the second slide? Yeah, okay. So, oh, that's quite terrible, whatever. Uh, yeah, so actually, yeah, uh, we, we started something like that, that uh, yeah, Bruno has like this ideation that uh, bring up the NFT graffiti on the Kusama, which we really embrace and uh, we find uh, it's an opportunity for us to drive and shine as being the in past uh, doing the, uh, rewriting the bulk of the GS apps now called as dot apps from React to the view. And uh, we applied our sort of the knowledge that how we can bring it in the faster way. And uh, yeah, we came uh, with the Kusama treasury funding. We started working on the NFT Explorer and uh, I will briefly uh, we go through what we so far done and where we probably will go. And okay, so briefly agenda is like that we did the NFT Explorer contribute to the email functionality to the remark spec. Uh, been experienced as the first, first multilingual lingual NFT gallery. And from there, mobile first NFT design and the packs. So yeah, from next. So I'm not sure if it's in sync or something like that, but I hope. Okay, so yeah, uh, the, our NFT gallery, it's like on the third slide, it's like a little NFT explorer. And uh, we, uh, the core of the daily, our deliverable was like the implement the remark spec. And uh, we implemented the, the standard, which was like on an ongoing basis, which was pretty experimental. We started with the version 0.1, then moved to the version 1.0. And uh, we, we we actually try to tackle with the problem that actually with the remarks, how it works is you need some sort of the, the server, which actually points you where the remarks are existing in which block. And we took like experimental path that we embraced the, the textile, the 3DB, which is literally like the RBDB for, I would like to say for more commercial use and with uh, better maintenance. And we hacked with uh, content storing on the IPFS uh, through the Pinata and uh, RV for the perma storage. And uh, that was like sort of our serverless approach. And meanwhile, yeah, we've been hacking on the support for the 3D models and uh, the packs, which is sort of as a uh, list I will talk later about it. 
Yeah, from there, yeah. Uh, speaking of emote uh, functionality, yeah, we were thinking that if uh, other all galleries on the Ethereum were uh, proposing the lot of off-chain uh, magic, and there was like really little happening on the on-chain, like I would like account for the 10 pencil, maybe less, that we think that actually the transactions on the Kusama are really uh, cheap and we would like to go put it like on the on-chain. And we actually figure out that it my uh, front run the price discovery, and it was like uh, catching up the interest of the users that that actually the NFTs are categories that it's like very uh, illiquid goods with like sort of the low, low velocity appraisal. And from there, we actually made it like uh, upon discussion that let's try it out and put it like in the remarks spec. It's like anyways, the graffiti. So it's like experimental what we liked the vibe about. So actually the briefly that we actually made it like in the Unicode emoji, like being on, on chain and could be like uh, uh, tied with the value add or something like tips. So actually it could be fairly extended later if somebody can use our repository and fork it, feel free to do it. So yeah, that's our emotion there. And yeah, from next, we actually been tried focused to be a mobile first design because a lot of the galleries were something like that been like desktop first. And we realized that, uh, for example, Nifty Gateway, their experience on the mobile really quite uh, was not well. And uh, we used the framework called the BFI, which based on the Bulma, which is like less opinionated uh, CSS framework. And we tried to do majority of interactions to be like mobile first. It's still hard, but we try to be like sort of the top first uh, interaction interface yeah and from uh, next to there we realized on the way to there that actually there's really literally no except the mafflet the who is like doing the mobile signer or something like that so uh, I, we sense that metabolt are injecting something like the other web view or something like that which is like really slowing the experience for the users but uh, we are aware that actually on the Kusama there is the bounty for the make this mobile experience better and there is a really bigger pool and I, yeah, I would like to encourage you to try to engage with other teams. Is there's huge discussion on the Polka assembly? Maybe probably Jem will have some link to talks or something like that. And yeah, we would like as well uh, fully support somebody who's working on this, some sort of the mobile signer or mobile experience because we've been in chat with some teams uh, who actually been working for the XR and XR signing and we would like really happily embrace that because yeah, mobile is like great and right in the Polka ecosystem there's only stuff with the Polkadot.js extension, you can sign uh, stuff and it's really breaking whole experience for the end users and the collectors and the artists. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, legacy compatibilities I would like to call ours about it. So yeah. And yeah, from there, uh, that was our hard uh, barriers we had to cross. And from there, yeah, uh, what we learned during the making the multilingual NFT gallery that we we set our goals to be like sort of the community driven. So actually we had like a lot of uh, contributors here and there, which started from the contributing, the translating the true language packs of our UI. And from there, we slowly transitioning to having the PRs where we actually putting some bounties for some uh, small PRs and marked all our issues for the good first issues and trying to be sort of the community driven with later adoption of could be probably community owner or something like that. So, so far, yeah, our numbers were like, there's some localized channels, some no, 28 contributors and 16 languages in your code. So actually you can check our code on the GitHub as well. Yeah, and from there, uh, uh, this is like invention. We subscribe ourselves in the, the Kusama treasury proposal to bring up some sort of call the packs. And the packs should be like the list of lists and uh, it should be sort of, uh, is uh, the gallery curator can create or cherry pick some particular NFTs or creations, and they can from there um, um, sort of uh, choose what their favorites are one or the collectors or future collectors or something like that. So actually, if you have some sort of the collection of the multiple artists, you can like uh, bring uh, their collections or items from the collections and bring it uh, like some presentation or something like that. Thanks to that Coda that have like the embedded uh, mode and you can like embed it uh, also this curation on some website. And yeah, we got like first version of the embedded uh, out there, but yeah, we'd like to tune it for the better experience because we know there's like a lot of bugs and uh, we can like could do better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. From uh, that side. Yeah. I would like uh, a yeah, quote. Uh, 
under the NFT graffiti and reward spec, and there's like no sort of the central server, and the, yeah, missing the chain logic on the the Kusama. So yeah, we our initial designs blueprints were like go freely serverless design on the Kusama, and uh, something like that to go with the textile and the three DB, which also really like uh, esoteric and like experimental, and we learned a lot. And from there, yeah, we actually embraced the Beata services, which is actually great, but the downside there is actually the pinning takes like only for uh, two years if you don't check headers or repin again. And from there, yeah, we used the RV for the assets and promised their storage for the Perma forever. So yeah, and uh, speaking of the serverless design that all our magic happens in the browser, which is super great, is that we have like the bunch of security issues. We are we are really aware of it. We just we didn't much communicate about them publicly. Maybe yeah, we should, but uh, we tried didn't want to attract much uh, attention to it. And uh, we realized that actually with uh, having all stuff in the browser, that anyone could probably uh, sort of uh, gain access to some the keys or something like that. Yeah, we are trying actively tackle with that and mitigate it. That uh, we have like. Uh, probably top three, the security issues we have that uh, we actually need to sort of the, think about it, how to uh, hide some secrets from the users. Because right now we expect that there is like not much uh, uh, popularity or the direction the audience are going through the interface. But later they will go and probably will find out. And yeah, we are already aware that uh, Remark team yeah, could us actually already find out about it. It's really great. And uh, we're trying actively take out and extract the keys out from the browser. And uh, other downsides were like something that uh, all, all the NFTs which are on the, the Kusama, they're actually being minted from the browser. So because we've been like manually the syncing up the States from the chain, but it turns out that actually it would be really uh, horrible that uh, right now the the Bruno Sintes was really great to invent the the remarks on the chain, bringing like on the experimental stage. But a long term, until the Kusama doesn't have any chain logic, it would be pretty hard to uh, take care that, for example, two and more user interfaces need to obey the laws of the state of the NFT or remarks, and that could like yeah turn in some really adversarial uh, states, or yeah, actually can, some double spending will can happen, and uh, you can buy it from the other interface or something like that. So you can imagine what could like go from there. So yeah, we actually really actively missing chain logic. So yeah, from from that uh, we actually realized that we should like go for now for our own. So yeah, we would like to uh, bring up on something we call right now the Meta Prime, and it's like we bring it like the experimental the NFT landscape. So from there, uh, and a lot of the community contribution, we learned that uh, we'd like to uh, held something like the steward ownership, which is like uh, quite new, but uh, so far, except the radical, I'm not aware of any others who actually embrace it actively. Would like to bring it like sort of in state of the executive community and uh, embrace the, the community participation in um, our efforts in long term. So actually, I would like to yeah, quote the uh, Sir uh, Tim Berners from '97 that actually it's intercreativity is about the building together and being creative together. So in this uh, sort of the state, we would like to uh, invite a lot of the creative uh, um, brains and uh, the programmers and the artists that would like probably are really seeking the space to the experiment. That would like to really embrace and talk more with them as we see there's like more and more not just the verticals or horizontals but there is maybe the third dimension when you can actually go yeah you may think about the metaverses or something like the other and dimensions or something like that but yeah we have like a lot of ideas where we can play out and uh, probably later the, with the nfts uh, may maybe it will be want nft at all right so maybe that's why i like and hint you and yeah from there uh yeah uh what is our vision that for now, we'd like to be like something, the, the focus, the infrastructure to provide sort of like streamlined signals for the highly liquid goods with the low velocity appraisal, which are right now the so-called NFTs are because uh, are, they are traded with, but not that fast as the any other native assets or the tokens or sort of called the DeFi. And we see that's, uh, that uh, 
line between the fungible and non-fungible stuff is probably thin or thin because you can have like the restricted and unrestricted uh, tokens and you can like uh, do with the other the metadata registry a lot of much thing even we think that uh, there are a lot of improvements could be done for the remark protocol it'd be really nice and yeah we could like to participate and our uh, core values are something like that we would like to favor the interoperable and the composable nft standards which so far there's like not that many if we'd like expect, but speaking from the other chains, like for example, near Solana and what is so over is there, there's even some chain agnostic movements. I would like really embrace it. And yeah, and cherry on the top. Yeah, we actually have our second milestone from the grant for what we'd like to do for the Kusama is like uh, contribute with some WebXR and the metaverse agnostic uh, framework or something like that. Yeah, and from there, uh, like what's the status that uh, we'd like to our basic ideation is like to leverage the other parachain primitives. And from there, we would like to embrace, for example, the privacy primitives from the Fala, uh, DeFi stuff from the Aqua, and for example, on liquidity from the Hydra, and et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, right now we are ongoing some integration, some social network from the Polka ecosystem. So you may guess who is it. And uh, right now, yeah, our status is like having some private testnet, and we are uh, playing with that right now. So yeah, we will show up once we have more to come or something like that. And uh, yeah, maybe you might ask yourself that how you can join. So actually, yeah, we have like a fresh Twitter found like today and uh, we are looking actively for the NFT like runtime pilot teams. There's like actually less than 10, but we expect there will be more of them later on. We actually in some active talks with them and the teams. And if you are yeah, experimental first, yeah, we are happy to welcome you. So, so far, yeah, you can subscribe on the MetaPrime network and uh, Twitter, MetaPrime uh, dash net. And yeah, thanks for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bob, for your presentation. It was great. Um, just a note for everyone, the Codado team is behind the Meta Prime. As you probably didn't catch, or if you didn't catch the vibe, uh, so the Codado gallery was uh, before, and what is going to happen will be next to Meta Prime. Um, just to recap. Uh, so thank you so much for presentation. Seems like there are no questions for you, Val. So I would like to invite to stage uh, Vicky and Jim and leave you. Here you, Vicky. So feel free to jump to the stage, Vicky. Hey. Okay. Hope you can hear us. Hey, Dan. Hey. How are you today? Uh, so, yeah, I'm good. Uh, we're gonna like do a little change of pace, right? It's going to go from a, a talk to just a conversation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. We actually learned a lot today. And, and yeah, we learned about programmable NFTs from Bruno to Metaverses from Val. And actually, my first question for you is what, what the NFT is for you, like non-fungible tokens. Most people just imagine some $1 million JPEG stored somewhere <laughs> on some IPFS and guy who is somehow super rich. And so what's actually NFT for you? What does it represent? Right. So, so I have like two answers to that question. Um, NFTs are technically kind of like just a pointer with some logic on how to change that pointer. Um, and by a pointer, I mean like there's a piece of information on the blockchain that says, this is the owner, this is the, the, this is what the, uh, thing represents, right? Um, and if you think about it that way, it's really simple, but like what you can do with it and what people are doing with it is they're using it to represent items. Like Bruno's talk was a really good example of all of the things you can do with just like a pointer and some information about it and maybe some logic as well on, on, on blockchain. Um, but there's the other side of what NFTs represent for creative people. And that is NFTs represent the ability to um, monetize your work or to represent your work in a different way uh, without having to have permission for some from, from somebody else to host it somewhere. If you're doing it right, that is. What do you 
what 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 do NFTs represent for you? Oh, actually, oh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so <laughs> for me, uh, NFT is like whatever is actually non fungible. So what else can you imagine after the million dollar images? Is like I don't know. You can use car. You can tokenize cars. You can tokenize houses. You can tokenize whatever. Also, Bruno in one so he mentioned that you actually by NFT you prove yourself the ownership that nobody nobody cares that if you have Prada wallet or something like that you just prove it that through the NFT that yeah you are the owner and it's the original one so yeah for me NFT is whatever which are no fungible assets yeah whatever is not fungible and then yeah as you ma mentioned you can use it for whatever you want you can yeah, tokenize your house through decentralized Airbnb, or you can tokenize your car to fractional ownership, so multiple people can now share share and own your car. So it's wow. <laughs> so I see that, that makes sense. yeah, yeah, future can be like, and and also guys mentioned that the current remark standard is something sort of like NFT graffiti. So yeah, you just force for some string into the blockchain and yeah uh the question is you you maybe know more than us uh, are there any smart contracts on kusama or will be there or what do you think yeah so so that's the that's the thing that's the reason why bruno made the remark standard uh why coda dot is like forced to use remark instead of like smart contracts on the chain and that's because Kusama and probably Polkadot, like Polkadot for sure, will probably never have smart contracts on chain. Why so? Um, because the the uh, the purpose of the networks is to be like a meeting place for lots of other networks, right? Okay. Uh, Polkadot and Kusama, that is. And if you put too much heavy logic, like smart contracts, on these chains, then you start losing the ability to do that other meta stuff. Um, so what ends up being the way you need to do NFT stuff is you do it off chain like Remark, or you have to do it on parachains like Unique or Meta Prime, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> oh, 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 um, oh, wow. Yeah. OK. Wow. OK. Yeah, yeah, that's. You basically meant that Kusama should man should do like one man job to be relay chain, nothing more, nothing else. Just yeah, provide provide that layer between other power chains. Yeah, that that makes sense. And also maybe I heard something about Palet. Can you explain the difference between the Palet and between the smart contract? And right, how to yeah. how to maybe use them in the context of NFTs. Um, so a smart contract is user submitted code. Um, and we're probably never going to have smart contracts on Kusama and Polkadot, but what might be possible, and this is an idea that's been going around with the name, the Chiba gallery, um, is that we might be able to get a pallet, which is a, a, like the developer team behind the chain or like governance. Uh, code that has been agreed on by governance put on chain. Um, we you might be able to put that logic on Kusama because the thing about pallets is because they are it's the code is not user submitted. Um, it can be much more efficient. It doesn't have to be metered because you don't need um, you don't need to trust the creator of the code. Uh, it's assumed that lots of people have checked the code because it's gone through the governance process. Um, so, so that's the idea behind uh, pallets. Like you can you can have much more efficient code on your chain, and this is what would be on parachains. Like this is what's on Unique. They will have pallets for their NFTs, and they all will also have contracts. Um, and then. This is what could be possible on Kusama. Like we could see an NFT palette, like the Chiba Gallery, on chain on Kusama. Okay, so you basically mimic ERC seven two one contract into the palette, as I think it's correct statement. Yeah, something along the lines. Like there's a little bit of difference when it comes to 
for Chiba specifically, there's a little bit of difference in the logic when it comes to like buying and selling stuff. Um, but it, it boils down to like it's it's a ERC twenty seven twenty one contract uh, without all the user sub submitted stuff, like without being able to um, provide your own logic on the chain natively. Uh, okay, so from the design perspective or performance perspective, are the pallets more faster than than I don't know storing the data on a smart contract? For example, yeah, yeah. Fetch, yeah. For example, fetching uh, staking staking module on Polkadot GS, it takes ages. So my question is if the NFT pallet would be more, much more effective than I don't know stake taking or NF NFT smart contract? Yeah, so in terms of like reading and writing from the chain, I don't think the performance will be significantly different. Um, what is uh, what is improved by using a palette is that you don't have any concept of gas. You just have like transaction fees, but those transaction fees are fixed. Um, so in terms of like complexity in user experience, you can make pallets a lot easier. And pallets can tie into the runtime a lot closer. Um, so you can do things like free NFT transactions or... Um, or you can have sort of, for example, badges that after, I don't know, you earn up on staking, I don't know, three Kusamas, you can get the badge that, yeah, you... I'm a sneaker. Yeah. yeah. Wow, it would be amazing have sort of features well wow. so that's what basically you can do with the pallet and you can do it do it with smart contracts am i right or you can yeah and can you interact between the pallet and smart contracts yeah so the you... thing about uh, the thing about the smart contract environment and substrate whether you're using the evm or you're using um ink. the ink yeah um, is that you can write your own built-in contracts or your own like things that you can call from inside the smart contract. Um, and those built-ins can call into pallets. Oh, wow. And obviously cool. from a pallet, you can call into the rest of the runtime. So you can even do a smart contract call in a pallet. So the inter interoperability between those two environments is really flexible. Um, we'll see what like things people do with that in the future, but I will have to have people, we will have to have a live NFT chain with both contracts mm. and pallets first. Wow, it would be amazing to have something like that. Uh, okay, sure. and what what about the pronouns of NFTs that can you prove that this art is from this artist and he, he or she doesn't submit it to the other chain? Can you do that on Substrate, for example, using off-chain worker or something like that? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are ways to do that. Um, I'm not certain that I would use an off-chain worker other than to build a bridge and then use the bridge to check the provenance or whatever. Okay. Um, but like at the end of the day, if, if the artist is using the same key, um, then like they should be able to release their art on as many chains as they like, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my opinion, at least. Yeah, yeah, could be. And what else would you use if you would like to build sort of pronouns tool? Um, like first thing which comes out of your head. It, it first thing go. that came out of my head is like uh, sort of like. Oracle networks, or like not Oracle networks, but like uh, uh, judgment networks, I guess, uh, where like a bunch of curators are like, oh, is this a legitimate piece of art? And then if people ask them for it, they'll check, oh, is this plagiarized or not? And they'll go contact the artist and say, is this you or is this a plagiarist? Yeah, okay, um, so some, something like notary in the real life that it puts your watermark, yeah, this is correct, and this is valid. Yeah. Oh, okay, nice. Nice. Put more humanity on the blockchain, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So more, more alternative jobs to pe sure. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So during your lunch, you can click is valid or not. Cool. And um, okay, so the question is, uh, if I wanted to make my own NFT chain, which palette should I use? 
I heard something about or ML or RML, but it's mm -hmm. something like a library more than library. So you have to build your own logic. If if I'm correct, that's true. So the ORML NFT palette doesn't um, provide any user facing functionality. You have to build all of the user facing functionality on top of it. It just provides like raw NFT logic, right? Um, so but then like, it's really yeah 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 some, uh, something like Chiva something like um, Akala's NFT palette that they're building on top of ORML NFT as well. What were you gonna say? Um, uh, I actually I forgot. <laughs> no, no, never mind. Yeah, what well, what other pods would you take? Like, um, so if you want something that's a complete solution already and not just a library, um, maybe the new, unique palettes once unique, like makes it public. Oh, they are um, not public yet. Oh, okay. Maybe they are. I need to check. <laughs> uh, okay. So maybe some governance tool, I think. And yeah, maybe that, that yeah. is all. If, if you have a governance on your chain, you can add whatever you want in the future. <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. That, then I think quoting would be fine. Actually, some sort of, I don't know, quadratic voting would be really nice. Are you aware of any quadratic voting palettes already? I think there are some, but yeah, there, there should be some. Wow. Okay, and my maybe last question for you is, uh, where do you see the usage of non-fungible tokens outside of these images and programmable art and yeah like use your fantasy and yeah where, where do you see yourself with nfts in i don't know one year sure um and i'm gonna ask, i'm gonna turn this question back around on you as well um sure so i like in my free time or like not in my free time, like when I have time to, I write yeah, a web time. novel. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I write a web novel and wow. the, the, the culture around web novels is like you write a chapter and then people pay for like increased chapter writing speed and stuff like that. Um, but like one idea that kind of caught on in my mind is like, hey, all of these characters and all of these storylines are unique, right? So you can only have one character doing one thing in this story. Um, so it would be interesting to represent the characters in a story as NFTs and have the community build a story together by interfacing NFTs with each other, saying like, if an NFT interacts with another NFT, then you have to write what happened in that interaction and save it on chain. And then over time, you develop like this interoperable story world where like all of these characters build histories and all of these um, people are building this story together. And that's something that like, I would like to see happen. Wow. It, if it, nobody makes it, then I'll probably take my existing web novel and like split it up into pieces and then like, turn every character in the story into an NFT and just give it to the community and see what happens. Um, that sounds like an interesting project for someday yeah. soon. Uh, it reminds me the episode of Black Mirror when you can vote for the alternative scenario. I think like the bandit wow. match, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Wow. It would be actually amazing to make such a story, alternative storyline for characters and vote, make people that they should decide which which storyline is the has the most big, has the biggest probability? Yeah. Yeah. In our last in our last few minutes, what what do you see as the usage of non fungible tokens outside of just um, million uh, dollar I'll, images? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I see that. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's the first thing on this talk. I see that. Yeah, we could tokenize assets like the real world assets into the NF into the blockchain, and also we could tokenize other digital assets into the into the blockchain. For example, access to the 
some sort of GitHub repository, you can you can have access on top of the NFT, or you can wrap other like gift cards into the NFT. For example, use some sort of secret hashes and put it put it like secret hash on chain, and then send the key for that for that NFT as a as a off chain message to the to the card donor. And yeah, I I see that there are like I don't know million other possibilities to, to hack around. And yeah, I think that art is like good good point, like good place to start. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely like the most obvious use of NFTs. Like start with art and then try to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's for example what Fis <laughs> that's the thing what Fisky posted on Twitter. I don't know if you follow Fisky, Fiskantas. Uh, yeah. He mentioned something like that. That for people it's hard to imagine DeFi because nobody cares about like finance. But for people to imagine like art or tokenized shoes, it's it's simple. So yeah, it's it's a good place to start. Good. Cool. Do we? Do you think we have any audience questions? Uh, I'm checking, but now nothing yet. Cool. Okay. Good. Okay. So that. Oh, maybe all questions from my side. If you wanna ask, if you are something you are interested in, feel free. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I know that like uh, Coda Dot has been working with um, the metaverse stuff and like three D stuff quite a lot. Um, how do you picture NFTs interacting with the metaverse. Oh, yeah. Wow, th that's, that's cool. Actually, yeah. Like a week ago, we got the Magic Leap, which is the first AR tool. Oh, wow, something. I see. We just did an air test. Yeah, 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 actually. Actually, one week ago, uh, the Magic Leap uh, glasses arrived. So we've been playing a bit with that. It's like AR technology to play around. And also we tried the Magic Leap Browser with Codedot. It was actually a nice experience to use joystick and scroll through the NFTs in the space. <laughs> but what <laughs> I met, what I actually imagine is that, that, yeah, you will have sort of 3D 3D object into the space using maybe a frame would be a really nice thing to have. And yeah, you can create sort of whole universe which will be loaded on your AR VR glasses or use just mobile phone. Like there are a lot of frameworks which you can use. And yeah, uh, also we have a sort of demo like in December that shows the proof work with uh, of big sim squares in the garage, so you should check it out. It's very really nice. And yeah, I think that using the packs, as well mentioned, you can uh, build your own like universe or your own gallery. You can also, you will be able to set that this image should be here, this image should be, I don't know, one meter away from this one, and so on and so on. And then you, yeah, press the button, start, start the metaverse or start the Scene and then using your phone, you will can walk around the pictures and see them like from the any direction you want. I think the same will be applied to 3D objects. How to aim to cut it? Wow. Question for you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe for Mate. <laughs> Wait for Mate. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the thing. Uh, that's the thing. We'll walk around the 3D objects and interact with them. Maybe you, when you when you will tap 
on sort of 3D image, it can it can change the color, as Bruno mentioned, that we can have programmable entities. That sounds exciting. Um, sorry to like kind of cut cut this short, but like sure, sure. scheduling conflict a little bit. Um, hopefully, Jessica has something exciting to give us after this. <laughs> Yep, Jessica, feel free to come to the stage. Um, yeah. Yep, I would like to welcome you. Thank you. So, Jessica is our next speaker. Feel free to present. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was really insightful to hear everyone here, uh, Vicky uh, Jam, talking about the nitty gritty aspects of uh, the NFTs in Kusama. Uh, Bruno, really great presentation. So this is all very, very interesting. I think I, I'm bringing to you a little bit of a different approach. Uh, I don't come from a technical background. I'm a visual artist. And I have been working with the Kusama Network since uh, I think uh, September last year. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my art is, why I'm in the blockchain space, how do I see Kusama uh, playing a really interesting role within the art community. I'm not really going to focus that much on NFTs, even though I'm going to share a little bit of some ideas that I have with different teams. Um, so I'm just going to get started. Let's see. I'm going to share... Um, my screen. So I have a presentation here for you, um, but um, I, I may kind of jump back and forth with videos. Or so here we go. Uh, so this is my artwork. Um, I take over spaces, um, large, medium-sized spaces, and generally galleries or museums, things like that. Taking over walls, ceilings, and floors to create these sort of immersive environments that take people into this dive into the space of information and to create a kind of a visualization, like a, a sensorial experience around the idea of the digital age. So the concept of information has been really important in my practice because I think that information uh, is what lies at the core of what we believe to be real, or what we believe to, to be the truth and sort of from a philosophical perspective, um, the the concept of truth has been changing throughout the ages. Like the, the concept of truth in the Middle Ages is certainly not the same as the, as the one that we have now because the informational sort of set of rules in our time uh, dictate a different sort of direction towards what the truth is. So the truth seems to be an absolute concept, but it really is not. So information is, I think, a very, very important concept, uh, you know, societally to think about information. Um, and then information takes place in, you know, a, kind of a, a space that is not uh, physical and it is structural in the sense that, uh, you know, information sort of exists since writing exists. And then we're able to access information uh, because there are records and archives of information and they're all connected. So there's this sort of structural idea of information that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in sort of juxtaposing that structural uh, form that information has, that it's kind of a living creature that we humans have created. And it has its sort of... Uh, um, its own uh, uh, characteristics, almost like personality. Uh, information is like a, a, an organism. Um, and then when I think about the structure of this organism, I cannot sort of leave aside structural physical forms. So I'm kind of at the, at the edge between phys physicality and reality. And that's why as an artist, my work has a lot to do with uh, architecture and a, a, a lot to do about physical structures. Uh, so these are just um, earlier works in my installation art process that dig a little bit into uh, creating these immersive sort of uh, disorienting experiences that are somehow futuristic looking that bring architectural elements and informational elements together. Um, and um, all done with paper, adhesive vinyl, hand cut, hand pasted, uh, even though it addresses a concept that it is um, purely 
informational and digital, m the means of production are very physical. And some people ask me, why don't you create these installation pieces in virtual reality? And I say, well, because it defeats the purpose of what I want to um, uh, explore. And it's that this dichotomy that we sense as opposites, virtual versus physical, is really not uh, that opposite. There's like a whole gradient of interactions in between physical and digital. And there is a, a relationship almost like complementary between the two. So for example, we had this an example that I use a lot. I have the computer right now here and I'm having this conversation. We're all learning from each other. People from all over the world are looking at this. We're having a, a, a conversation in this dynamic space of information, but then it needs uh, this sort of host, which is our computers that are physical. So, so they're all, uh, the physical and the virtual are sort of intertwined in this very close relationship. Uh, the computer itself used to be a dynamic form or an informational concept. It lived on, on drawings. It was an idea. It perhaps was a 3D model before it was an object. So, so these two um, um, elements are important and I don't want to leave behind the sort of physical part of um, you know, reality. So um, I play around with concepts like a black hole mixed with a motherboard. How can we put these things together even though they may seem completely dissimilar? So I kind of drag elements from um, cosmology, from science, from physics, from philosophy. And then because I do these works that are heavily um, influenced by the idea of information and the idea, the idea of uh, met meta versus not kind of bringing them outside of what we're thinking about the uh, the metaverse and the digital space, but metaverses that are almost like from cosmology. Um, I was approached by uh, Truebit, which is a blockchain project who was kind of following my artwork. And uh, Jason Toich, the founder of this project, he said, I think that blockchain technology uh, could be a really interesting subject for you because um, there's, you know, we're building uh, this way for creating value, which is only existing in the, the, the physical form. So the whole uh, paradigm change that blockchain is bringing to the world and which, is, which makes it kind of difficult for people to understand, for example, NFTs, um, uh, traditional, the traditional art world is kind of, starting to to get it but it is a difficult thing to understand how is it that a jpeg can be owned like what is the paradigm shift uh in with the concept of ownership that is bringing me to say okay i own this thing that it's you know bits uh, how is it possible that i can own something that is outside of the physical realm so blockchain in my opinion kind of brings to the digital space um, the qualities that we see in the physical space and ownership is one of those. Um, so the fact that you can tokenize, the fact that you can get value, that you can encrypt and create scarcity um, sort of resembles uh, that idea of what we uh, sort of are used to interacting with the physical. So this is an art piece that was sort of my doorway to the blockchain space. This was in 2017, and this is when Jason Toch reached out to me and he said, I have some funds that I would like to use uh, for you to create a, an artwork that is gonna represent the space of blockchain, but also to, to bring people together uh, uh, to, to the blockchain space from a, an experiential perspective. We talk about blockchain and then people are like, start like you can start seeing like, ah, uh, you know, the, the, the brain connections are kind of going to all directions. Um, and it's precisely because of that paradigm change, just like the concept of decentralization is really not embedded in our, um, uh, network of, neurons there are those connections are really not there because it's new we're really not used to using these forms uh and it's we're starting to sort of opening that mental road little by little and then art is going to be 
or the way that I'm seeing art in blockchain besides NFTs and tokenizing and, and monetizing <laughs> is using art as a conduit, as a, as a uh, connector, as a doorway to bring people into the blockchain space in a sense where they feel you know, warm and involved and engaged. So um, these are some other images of this artwork, uh, all made hand cut, hand pasted. It is, this was a whole semester with a university and a group of students putting this together. Uh, a whole museum, different wings of the museum were taken over. Mm. And then uh, this was the proposal for this one um, bridge. Uh, it was inspired by the Deutsche Theater Bridge, which is the reason why Jason Teutsch reached out to me and that was what, what we put together. So it's the structure uh, in, uh, inspired by a Klein bottle where you enter and go around. Uh, we weren't able to actually produce the artwork because this was in 2018 early and then there was the, the crash in the beginning of the uh, crypto winter. And so this sort of stayed there but I continued with, you know, exploring, exploring other blockchains, uh, building up community. That's another another subject that I haven't touched yet, but it's important. As I create these artworks, I put together um, a public programs around it. So I invite speakers and create a, you know, panel discussions, or invite artists to take over the artwork and make projections or musicians and we have a concert. So the artwork becomes the sort of hub for the community to gather because you know the space visually is full, but it actually somehow is empty. So how do you activate it? Um, so with these activations, that the, was the plan with the Deutsche Ethereum Bridge. And it's what I'm already doing since 2017 um, identifying artists, programmers, people in the space who are interested in art and blockchain and how can we collaborate and i'm really really um sort of in love with the blockchain community and that's the reason why i keep working in this space it's because it's very open it's very giving and generous and there's uh really really smart interesting people to connect with and people who are really interested in um collaborating and i believe in sort of this holistic vision where we can have people from different realms and different uh, uh, practices working together. And that's when you see really innovation coming along. So um, with the uh, Kusama network, I really wanted to continue with this idea of making this installation piece that I was not able to do with the Deutsche Ethereum, thinking of, of the concept of the bridge as something that is important within the blockchain space and within the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem certainly made a lot of sense to continue with that idea of the bridge. Uh, so um, I'm working with a Vancouver Biennale of Public Art, and this is the, the Voxel Bridge, the project that I applied for some funds from the Kusama Treasury to be, be able to um, uh, fund a section of this project. Um, so it is in the south side of the Camby Street Bridge in Vancouver. Uh, you see here, this is an underpass, it's pedestrian and bikes underpass, and it's pretty dull, it kind of needs something, and we were able to talk to the city with the Vancouver Biennale and get all the permits to take over the space. It's um, six, 600 feet long, which is roughly 180 meters long, and it has 11 columns, and I put together this visualization in physical form, and then um, I hired a group of um, architects and engineers to put together this on, you know, on digital form, create a visualization. So you, there's actually a, a Unreal Engine uh, Oculus Rift uh, way so you can actually get in and see it. And that's how I presented the project to the city, which was lots of red tape. And I've been working in this for some time now. <clears throat> so um, I want to share some some videos so the um uh, the proposal started uh by creating a, a a 3d map of the bridge uh to get the exact measurements uh this is using a leica a camera or scanner which is you create a cloud map this this leica scanner what it does is measures all the points and takes a photograph of a little point 
and then it puts all those points together into this cloud map. And then this goes into uh, another program called Rhinoceros, which is a architectural tool. And then we created the, you know, the whole design on it. Mm. So uh, the um, projection, which is kind of the, the visual effect that we are trying to achieve is to create the sense of depth, to create the sense of space within uh, the, you know, the space of the, the bridge to allow for uh, the users who are gonna be, you know, people walking around. There's a, a subway station uh, right next to here and they'll be able to, to engage with the Kusama network in this way. They're just gonna end up walking by it. Um, and so with the, some of the Kusama team members, um, we identified the most relevant, say, um, events in the Kusama network since it, 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 it started. And so you're gonna be able to explore the Kusama network in this bridge. Uh, the blocks are gonna be blocks that are on the network. So using augmented reality, you will be able to uh, go around and see these events. So I have some more examples here. Um, this is the proposal that I put together to submit to the to the council for review. I'm happy I'm actually gonna share it with you here um, in case you're curious. And um, uh, let me get back to, to this. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll talk about the augmented reality integration in a second. Uh, so the, the, the treasury supported the, in, the printing of the, the vinyl that is going to be installed and the augmented reality piece. Uh, so these are just some samples of the, you know, production plan, the, all that stuff and some tests that we are, did. Um, the artwork has, uh, these 10 points of view. And then in these 10 points of view, there will be 10 markers on the floor, which markers are like QR codes that are going to activate uh, the, uh, the, the 3D um, integration. So uh, the integration is bringing, uh, sorry about that. Uh, the integration is bringing uh, the elements into the space. So you won't only just see them on the walls, but you're, you're going to be able to see all these elements kind of floating in the space. And these floating elements are the ones that, are gonna give you information on uh, the events in the Kusama network. So you'll be able to tap into uh, the block and then you're gonna be able to see information, uh, what this block number is, uh, what information was there recorded, uh, all these different things regarding uh, validators, regarding the treasury itself, um, the, the first block created when there was a, a baby that was registered on the on the Kusama network on what block that was. So all these different fun things that uh, the Kusama network's been doing since uh, uh, CC3, I guess. Um, so what I want to do with the project is bring the art project community that I've build, been building. We called it art project because I was just doing this art project in the space, and it just started growing. And what we've been doing is uh, gathering uh, collaborators in different hackathons and different conferences and just creating a space for artists and programmers to do experiments with um, Arduino's Raspberry Pis, art and integrations that bring blockchain data uh, to you know physical, physical pieces. So mm, the concept of NFT, and tokenization um, are not really have not really been the focus of this community, even though it became the the main thing. So if you go to the Telegram channel that we have right now, for example, you're just gonna find all all the people sharing their tokenized art, kind of like it's mutated into this place. Uh, but I think the community sort of needs uh, new spaces. So I really want to bring uh, the Kusama blockchain sort of attention. Uh, towards the community so they can learn about it more and see how they can interact with Kusama in a creative way because Kusama does have uh, these properties, of course. Um, so yeah, so if you want to propose something, you're interested in 
um, you know, connecting with other artists or programmers or doing collaborations. Uh, I put together down here, the lower one is the uh, Art Project Telegram where you, where you can connect. Uh, artproject.io is the website, you can learn more there. And then on the top, you can just see my website and learn more about like my individual work. Um, and then I also want to share uh, something that I've been doing with the team who's creating the augmented reality piece of the artwork. Uh, their name is uh, Spheroid Universe, they're a blockchain um, native project. And um, I've been working with them on creating open calls for artists to bring um, to bring uh, three dimensional art onto uh, onto spaces, large spaces, like thinking of public art in in this form. Um, so I've been talking to them actually about bringing this project to Kusama. We're still talking, uh, but we're looking for people who would be interested, uh, primarily developers who are interested in. Um, working with us and bringing, bringing, uh, turning, kind of creating the NFT development part to bring uh, augmented reality pieces onto being tokenized and perhaps in the sort of either marketplace or just as a cultural project. I don't know if this is something that you, that you find interesting, augmented reality into NFTs. Uh, that's something that I haven't seen yet in any other blockchain like Ethereum. I don't see that they have anything of this nature. Um, it's Sphere Universe. Oops, I'm sorry. Sphere Universe already has all the technology developed, and I think you know they're just ready to deploy uh, this idea of tokenizing uh, these mega structures that take place in spaces, and they use this technology that. Uh, sees uh, cues from the space and recognizes where it is. So this exhibition wasn't all over the world. So if you go to the to the Denver Art Museum and you use the app, you're going to be able to see that artwork. So I'm going to also share this one here in case you guys are interested. And um, yeah, I guess I guess that's. What I have to share with you, I think I see a question here. I'm gonna leave this one here in case you want to reach out. Uh, what are the different categories in NFT and what do you think is the five to 10 years landscape? Uh, what will survive and how does the, the interoperability, interoperability work in different NFT projects? Uh, yeah, this is a, 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 a long question. So uh, you have several questions here. So what are the different categories in NFTs? Well, I think Jam and Vicky mentioned that within NFTs right now, what's being explored is in the art world or in the uh, JPEG kind of collectibles, uh, but definitely NFTs have other categories that can be explored that are out outside of, you know, the entertainment sort of industry. Um, I think uh, between the next five to 10 years landscape, uh, what do you think is a five ten? I do believe that um, uh, metaverse integrations with NFTs, things like what I'm proposing with um, Spherid Universe, with uh, tokenizing three-dimensional objects that you can interact and explore in your own space. Um, that's why I call this breaking the screen. It was my curatorial approach to this. It's because we are somehow limited to experience NFTs because of the sort of that screen limitation. Um, do you hear me? I see something. Yes. Okay. Um, so breaking the screen is going to be bringing the NFTs outside of the screen that you, in a way that you can like m physically almost interact with them. Like if you think about the future using augmented reality or virtual reality using, uh, you know, your headset and being able to own the objects of the space where you belong to in your own headset. Um, when you have ownership of these objects, the experience of virtual reality is going to be a, a total 
different experience where it's going to become more real in the sense that you have ownership of the space and that you can create your own identity in this space because of sort of objects that you own. Because if we think about our identity, it's a lot related to the, the objects that we own and that we create around us to create that identity. So I think in the five, 10 year landscape, um, three-dimensional objects and, and uh, virtual reality objects that are tokenized are gonna be strong, but that's my thought. And uh, how will how what will survive and how does the interoperability work in different NFT projects? I think obviously interoperability is, is one of the main things that is gonna let things survive or die. Uh, and with projects such as Kusama, Polkadot, uh, that is bringing bringing these blockchains together, um, that's certainly gonna be necessary for for these interoperable. Uh, NFTs to to take place to happen. Otherwise, I think it's it's not going to survive. Definitely, interoperability and su and survival uh, are linked together. So that's my my take on that. I hope I answered your question. Um, so yeah. So I guess that's that's it. Um, if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them uh, via email or um, anywhere else there. so so much jessica your presentation was awesome i'm really looking forward to see the vancouver installation how it goes and she executed i hope that as the covid restrictions are going to like disappear slowly hopefully so we will be able to execute your installation very soon Yes, definitely. We will create also a net um, a video documentation of this integration. And um, we're also thinking of bringing the integration into um, kind of like a Mozilla Hubs where anybody can go around and access. And, and this bridge, this voxel bridge, is basically like a library of events in the Kusama network that can be uh, explored in this fun, creative way instead of just going to the, the polka scan and you know, uh, kind of dealing with the ledger um, explorers that tend to be a little bit you know cold. Uh, so it's kind of creating ways of engaging people with uh, Kusama in a in a dynamic way. It's very interesting how you can connect the blockchain, the digital space, with the actual physical space and with the rising metaverses and everything digital. Basically, uh, you can uh, go to the Mozilla Hubs or similar metaverse-like platform and then basically recreate the physical space. And it's interesting to see from an artist's perspective how you are trying to connect the digital space, the what is actually blockchain and what does it means with the um, artwork and executed by you know blockchains by basically drawing boxes on a floor and walls and any physical object and then executing it this way, which is super interesting. And I don't see any more questions, so we can probably wrap up this event. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jessica, and all the speakers for attending this event. It was such a pleasure to meet you all in a virtual space, thanks to Ermi. And um, I'm going to end this session. Feel free to go to the networking session which will be like tables if there are some people or some attendees left so we can have a chat there on the tables thank you so much everyone for attending thank you so much daniel for giving me the chance to organize this event and that's it from me oh last question uh okay uh, that's not related to Jessica. We will answer you this question later. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.